All right, well, good morning, everybody. It's, it's a joy and an honor to be back in Japan. Thank you all for having me. My thinking this time around is to talk about a few things that I see coming over the course of the next year, what to expect in 2025. So what better way to start on something like that than to um, talk about last year? So this is the release schedule over the last year of development. So you see we put out six major releases, each of which containing about 14,000 individual commits, sometimes more, sometimes less, coming from around 2,000 developers. Generally about 250 of those developers in each kernel release are contributing to the kernel for the first time. So we're still bringing people into our community. So it's a, a table that shows a lot of activity, but it's also really just the same table that I have been putting up for years. It gets a little bit boring. Sometimes I feel like I could just as easily be putting up, say, a train schedule. The information here is useful. Sometimes you need it, but it is neither exciting nor interesting, really. So, um, but that's the way it is. And I want to point out one real similarity with the train table which is that kernel releases are also quite regular and follow a schedule that you can rely on. They come out every nine or 10 weeks, really without exception. And when I say without exception, I mean that over the course of the last 15 years or so, there have only been two such exceptions, two kernel releases that took more than 10 weeks, right? And if you look at the dates of those releases, they may seem familiar to people who've been watching. 4.15, which came out in 2018, came out right after the initial disclosure of the Meltdown and Spectre hardware vulnerabilities. So we had to merge thousands of lines of, of critical security code in the middle of a development cycle. And so that took us a little bit of time to stabilize it and to get that kernel release out. 3.1, released 14 years ago now, was contemporaneous with the compromise of the kernel.org infrastructure. So in the middle of that development cycle, we lost our entire development system that we worked on. It had to be torn down and rebuilt from the beginning and all that. And so that turned into a 12-week development cycle. So the point that I want to make here is this is the magnitude of event it takes to, to slow down our kernel releases. In the absence of something like this, it takes nine or 10 weeks. So if we assume and hope that there will be no events of this magnitude in the coming year, Here's the release schedule for 2025. All right, November 17th, we'll see the 6.12 kernel. I'm quite confident of that date. I don't expect that to change time. And then every nine or 10 weeks, usually nine, over the course of the coming year, through to the, to the final, oh, that got changed a bit, the 6.18 release that will come out in the first part of December of next year will likely be the long-term stable release for that year. So there it is, that's what's to expect over the coming year. You can plan your vacations around it and, and such. But what's really perhaps more interesting is not these kernel release dates, but what's going to be in them and how will they be developed? So that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of my time talking about here. Starting with a topic that I've heard not much about here, but certainly is much discussed in the development community as a whole, which is the Rust programming language and its use in kernel development. Rust, of course, is a relatively new programming language. It was designed for systems level programming, the same sort of provide the same kind of efficiency that C provides, but it was also designed around memory safety to avoid all kinds of, of memory related bugs that are simply endemic to the C code that the kernel is written in now. Rust holds out the prospect of simply eliminating entire classes of bugs. In, in new code that is entered into the kernel. And that, of course, is an enticing prospect. It's something that we would very much like to see. The initial support for Rust was merged almost two years ago now in the 6.1 kernel release. But it was merged as an experiment, right? The idea is we will see how well Rust works. If it works well for kernel development, we will keep it and continue to use it. If it doesn't work, it can be removed from the kernel and we will try again with something else. Uh, the advance of the Rust work in the kernel has proceeded slowly enough that some people have occasionally worried if this experiment is not succeeding. But um, at the maintainer summit held in September, where a number of top kernel maintainers discussed the Rust programming language and the challenges we are facing with it, 
there, was, there were several conclusions that came out of it, but the one I really want to relate here is this one here. The conclusion of the maintainer summit is that rust in the kernel is viable. It is going to work. There was really nobody there who was saying that this is not working, that this experiment will fail, that rust will have to come out of the kernel. So while the experimental status has not, in any official sense, been taken away, I believe that we will, that Rust has succeeded, has shown that it will work, and that we will go forward with it in the kernel. Not that it's going to be entirely smooth sailing. There are some interesting obstacles still, starting with the fact that the Rust language itself is still evolving. So it's hard to build a solid foundation for kernel development on a platform that is still shifting, but that is stabilizing over time, and the Rust language developers are committed to helping the kernel iron the rest of this stuff out. So that should work out. There is only one compiler for the Rust programming language. That makes it hard to know what your standard for the language is when you only have one implementation of it. But perhaps even more problematic is the fact that the Rust compiler does not support all of the architectures that the kernel can run on. As a result, Rust code that is entered into the kernel cannot be compiled for all the, all the systems out there that the kernel supports. This is a problem and is going to need to be solved by adding Rust support to the GCC compiler. People are working on that. It's going more slowly than people would like. It's a, an under-resourced project, but it is getting there. Interface design within the kernel. Rust developers take a very different approach to how you design your internal interfaces than C developers do, simply because the Rust language makes it possible to, to check so many factors of the correctness of the code. So that if you design your interfaces right, code that compiles has a very high chance of being correct. C code is much more based on understandings and promises between developers with no way for the compiler to check it. This creates a bit of a discord and some friction between the Rust and the C developers in the kernel. It's causing, it's forcing changes on both sides. I think the end result will be improvements for both the Rust and the C code. Code. It will make the C code better, but it's something that we will have to work out over time. And then finally, there is the issue of backports. The older kernels that are used by, say, enterprise distributors and such do not have Rust support or any of the stuff that we've been adding to it. That means that any Rust feature added to the kernel now cannot easily be backported to those kernels. That is creating resistance to the addition of certain features in Rust right now. This is a problem that will naturally go away over time as, as those kernels advance, but it's going to take a while to resolve as well. So we have things to work out, but Rust is going forward. And there are a few things that we can look forward to, starting with the, the continued merging of infrastructure. It is nice to be able to say that we can write a device driver in Rust, but a device driver in the kernel must make use of services provided by many other subsystems within the kernel and Rust interfaces have to be written for every single one of those interfaces. That is what much of the work over the last year, two years has been, is providing those interfaces. That work will continue for quite some time, but it is getting there. Once the necessary infrastructure is in place, there are some drivers that we are likely to see. The one I think we most likely see first is the Android binder driver. Binder being a an inter-process communication system used within, the, within Android systems is a highly security critical piece of software. It would be very nice to have implemented in a safer language. The, the driver is there, it is written, it works, it's mostly waiting on infrastructure and could go in fairly quickly once the infrastructure is there for it. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see that happen this year. There is a driver for Apple graphics processors out there, it works. It has been shipped by some distributors now, but it is hung up on getting into the mainline kernel due to problems mostly that have nothing to do with Rust. It will take some time to work out yet. I'm not sure how long that will take. Perhaps more interesting and more significant is the Nova driver, which is the replacement for the kernel's driver for NVIDIA chipsets, which is important both for graphics and for AI applications and all the other things you would use a GPU for. This is a relatively new project. It only started in February, so I do not expect that driver to be ready in the coming year, but we will see, see it progress over this time and will be one of the most significant uses of Rust, I think, in the kernel in, in the coming years. So it's going forward. It's going to happen. It will still be slower than a lot of people would like, but we will get there. 
For something that's happening rather more quickly, let's talk a little bit about CPU schedulers, the part of the kernel that decides which process gets to run on the CPU at any given time. For decades now, the kernel has had a rule that there can only be one CPU scheduler that must work across all the systems that the kernel supports. We have dozens of file systems that you can choose from. We have many other areas of the kernel where users can select a subsystem that suits their workload best, but there's one CPU scheduler. So that means that our CPU scheduler has to work on everything from the tiniest of embedded systems all the way through to the most massive of data center machines and so on and support them all. There have been some interesting results of this, one of which is that we do have a scheduler that can scale across that entire range of workloads, which is an impressive bit of work. It's, it's been very hard to get there. But on the other hand, there are user communities out there who have never felt that the scheduler suits their needs as well as it could. Desktop users have often been very vocal about that. But if you see in, for example, very large data center cloud provider settings, we've seen there as well that, that some companies have done their own internal scheduler work to try to address this, the shortcomings they see in the CPU scheduler. So there are problems with that. The one scheduler is also a real bar to entry for any developer wanting to add changes to the scheduler because any change you make has to work, again, across that entire range of workloads, which means that it's very easy to regress somebody else's workload, which you don't have access to, you don't really even know exists, and cannot test. That makes, it, makes changing the scheduler an intimidating prospect and has, I think, impeded scheduler development overall. So, bringing to this a subsystem called SCEDX. This is a new scheduling class, which allows a new CPU scheduler to be written and loaded from user space as a set of BPF programs. So, on a running system, you can load your new scheduler and completely change how the CPU scheduler works in the kernel. This brings a number of interesting advantages. Now, anybody can write a CPU scheduler focusing on their particular needs. It makes iteration quick and safe. BPF programs cannot crash the kernel, or at least that is the theory. Um, if you need to change your scheduler, you just make your change, recompile the code, unload the existing one, load a new one. You don't have to build a new kernel. You don't have to reboot. You don't have to worry about crashing the kernel. So it makes development and iteration much easier, much friendlier. And it allows developers to focus on their one specific use case because they're writing a scheduler for themselves. They're not trying to support the entire range of users of all of Linux. So it makes a lot of things possible and has led to a very quick explosion of creativity. There are a lot of schedulers that have been posted already. This is not the full list. I don't have time to go over them, but I do want to mention the first one, LAVD, which is being written for gaming systems and specifically to be shipped on the Steam Deck gaming platform. This is a commercial product. This is not somebody playing around with schedulers. It is designed to, to maximize the interactivity and response time of the game and eliminate stalling and stuttering. They've had great success with it and do in fact intend to ship it. There's a whole lot of other developments out there exploring different areas of schedule design. There's a whole new community that has exploded around this particular aspect of kernel development. And perhaps the most interesting thing is that this has happened despite the fact that SCEDX is not in a released kernel because it was only merged for 6.12. It will only be in a released kernel next month. I think that once you see SCEDX in, in a release kernel and in people's distributions, that this creativity is going to grow another step yet, and we're going to see some very interesting things happening. This is an area to watch. Very different. Let's talk about CVE numbers just briefly. You may have noticed that there's been quite a few of them, and there will be quite a few more. CVE numbers are the identifier attached to vulnerabilities in software, in the kernel or elsewhere. As of about February, the kernel is now its own CVE numbering authority, meaning it assigns its own CVE numbers. This is a change that was made in response to a number of problems with the whole CVE system. Many free software projects have made this change. The interesting thing about the kernel is that given its place in the system, many bugs that would be just bugs in a normal application are security vulnerabilities at the kernel level. So the, the CVE people are assigning CVE numbers to any bug that looks like it could conceivably be exploitable as a vulnerability, 
This has resulted in the issuance of, of large numbers of CVE numbers and has created discomfort for anybody whose job it is to try to backport fixes, say, for every CVE number to an old kernel. You know, if it's the enterprise distributor or the civil infrastructure project or people like that, suddenly they have thousands of these things that they're trying to address in their kernels. But as Case Cook pointed out a while back, if you are unable to keep up with the CVE number flow now, you were not keeping up with the flow of vulnerabilities in the kernel before. That situation has not changed. The only thing that has changed, the problem is now much more visible than it was. If you do want to keep up with all the CVE fixes, the way to do it is to run the stable kernel releases that come out of, out of, out of our project because those kernels, by definition, have fixes for all of these problems. That's really all I have to say about CVE numbers. If you want to know more, I strongly suggest going to Greg Crow Hartman's talk this afternoon because he is deep into this and knows far more about it than I do. So the last thing I want to talk about is tooling. I have tooling for kernel development now. I have said for years that the kernel community tends to be slow to adopt new tools. We are the community that operated for 10 years without even a source code management system after all. So we can be a little bit slow, but when we do adopt tools, we often change the world with it. So there are things that are happening. I just want to point out a few of them because I think they're significant. How many of you know about a tool called B4? Not very many. This is a tool that is worth investigating. B4 has revolutionized life for kernel maintainers. It, it automates many of the tasks of handling patches, of applying them, of sticking reviewed by tags into them and all that sort of stuff. I really do not understand how, how we kernel maintainers functioned without it. It has made life so much easier in that regard. B4 is growing new features to help with the whole process of patch submission and patch review. I think we will get to a point, perhaps even this year, where it is possible to submit at least simple kernel patches, review them, and get them merged without ever having to touch an email client, which is something that, that a lot of people, I think, would like. Even though email will remain at the core of the kernel development process, we are developing ways to avoid it for people who wish to do that. So there's the URL for it, a very interesting tool worth, worth looking at. Bug tracking. The kernel project as a whole doesn't really use a, a centralized bug tracker for a, a number of reasons, mainly due to the fact that a lot of the developers just don't like it. But um, we do have a Bugzilla instance. This has suffered over time because Bugzilla itself has not been supported all that well. That situation has improved, and so support for the kernel Bugzilla has as well. But there's still a lot of developers within the kernel community who just don't use it and don't have a centralized bug tracking tool. To help with some of that, there's a tool called Bug Spray that is being developed. Bug Spray is intended to, to interface Bugzilla with an email-based workflow so that people can deal with bug tracker entries and resolve them and such without ever having to actually log into the into the, the web page and deal with things that way. Should make life easier for developers working with bug tracking. I do want to mention briefly an important subset of bug tracking, which is regression tracking. In the kernel community, we have a strict rule that says we cannot release kernels with regressions. If one kernel works for a particular task, all the subsequent kernels must also work for that task. The problem is you cannot actually live up to that rule if you don't know where your regressions are so that you can make sure you have fixed them. So it's a little bit discouraging to have learned last month that the developer who was doing regression tracking for us has lost the funding for that work. And we don't have a funded regression tracker at the moment. That I hope will change soon. I think there's a real effort to change it. But it is an example of the sort of problem that we find in in kernel development and far beyond, honestly, of important tasks that nobody feels the need to fund and hope that somebody else will, will fund. So I hope that this will get better in the, in the near future. And finally, testing. Kernel community has not always been all that good about testing either. We used to say, not entirely jokingly, that the reason we keep users around is so that they can test our kernels for us. 
But that's not really the best way to do it. We can do better than that. So it's nice to see, for example, that we have a, um, a, a growing set of kernel self-tests, and perhaps more importantly, a growing expectation that new features should come with self-tests so that we know that they, can, that they work and continue to work. And I hope that will continue. There are projects like Kernel CI doing continuous integration testing and all of that to make sure that bugs don't get into the kernel. And a great deal of testing that happens around our stable kernel releases to make sure that they too are as bug free as we can make them. So our testing picture is getting better and I hope it will continue to. In general, our tooling picture is getting better. I hope to see a lot of improvements in 2025. I do need to point out though that much of the work that I talked about here is the product of one developer working at the Linux Foundation. We really need more people working on, on tooling development. This is an investment that pays off many times over. So I hope that we will see, see more investment in that area in the coming years. And with that, I am done. Uh, things I talked about, releases every nine, 10 weeks, Rust happening slowly, SCEDX happening quickly and um, CV numbers tooling getting better. I am out of time, it is time for the raffle, and I thank you all very much for your attention.